You said that four times as many antibiotics are used to feed animals than given to humans. Explain why this is a problem. So I want to be clear that this, this statistic of four times as much antibiotic sold for use in animals as for use in humans in the United States is a couple of years out of date now. Those numbers actually date from 2011, which was a year when it was particularly easy to match up the two different databases. The situation in humans hasn't changed much. This, the numbers for animals are actually trending down a little bit, and that's really encouraging, and we can talk about why that is. All of this dates back to the beginning of the antibiotic era, to 1948, when a kind of rogue biologist who's working for one of the early antibiotic manufacturers wants to find uh, an extra use for his company's drug. And he feeds manufacturing waste leftovers from making antibiotics to chickens. And the chickens get fat faster than they should have. So the way this becomes institutionalized is that tiny doses of antibiotic, way too small to cure an infection, are added mostly to the feed of animals, just you know, ground up in a you know, couple of grams per ton, and uh, added to the feed of cattle and hogs and chickens. In the 1940s and 50s, they just perceived that this worked. And they didn't do a very good job of interrogating why it was that it worked. We're pretty sure now that what happens is that the antibiotics, when they're consumed, affect the mix of bacteria that lives in our guts, the guts of every living thing called the gut microbiome, in such a way that it allows animals to extract more nutrition from their feed more efficiently than they would have otherwise. So they put on tasty muscle more quickly than under the otherwise normal feeding regime they would have. So that's the benefit in the cost-benefit equation of feeding antibiotics to animals. The cost is that it inevitably generates antibiotic-resistant bacteria. And that's, it's inevitable because antibiotic resistance is an inevitable biological process. Any time you expose a bacterium to something that is coming at that bacterium to kill it, the bacterium is going to want to defend itself. And the defenses that they put up, the mutations that they create or adopt to defend themselves against chemical compounds, that's antibiotic resistance, the thing that makes antibiotics not work anymore. So antibiotic resistance develops in the gut of animals when they're fed antibiotics and then washes into the environment or travels on their meat, and but creates more antibiotic resistance in bacteria, disease bacteria, than otherwise would have existed in the world. How did chickens change and grow so much over the last 100 years? The process of changing chicken from those skinny little chickens of the beginning of the 20th century to the big, blocky, docile, muscle-heavy chickens that we have today in industrial agriculture. That's a process that starts with feeding them antibiotics, but it doesn't stop there. Um, in addition, there has been, over the decades, precision crossbreeding, just old-fashioned crossbreeding, nothing transgenic or GMO, that creates animals that have higher appetites, higher metabolisms, less desire to exercise. And so they both are producing meat more quickly and they're not using energy so much. Um, people in the, the, the poultry industry call it feed efficiency. How much feed do you feed to an animal in order to create a pound of flesh? Chicken's feed efficiency is really, really good. And that didn't happen naturally. It happened because of crossbreeding. So antibiotics, then crossbreeding, and then precision nutrition as well. The, 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 there's an enormous industry of making feed for livestock. And, and that feed, which is different for every species, is really tuned up to get them the maximum, to produce in them the maximum amount of muscle production as fast as possible. So it's kind of a, a sort of a rolling, snowballing process of antibiotics first, and then crossbreeding, hybridization, and then precision nutrition. And all of those end up in that chicken that we have today that in, in large scale poultry production is so very different from the chickens of 100 years ago. Why do we give antibiotics to most healthy animals on the planet on most days of their lives? So I think it's important to say that there are legitimate uses for antibiotics 
in livestock, and that is when livestock are sick, when they actually are brewing or have developed an infection. It is a completely legitimate thing to give antibiotics to make animals better. To not do that would be a violation of animal welfare. I, I am definitely not saying that we should never use antibiotics, but we shouldn't use antibiotics for the things that they were not designed for. When we give antibiotics to human beings, we say you need a test, you need a prescription, and you need to take that prescription until it's done to avoid resistant bacteria arising in your system. We ought to behave the same way with antibiotics in livestock. And, and the good news is, is that we are starting to do that in the United States, that, that a combination of changes in regulation and especially changes in consumer awareness are really leading industries to use antibiotics only in the most appropriate ways. How did chickens go from a small bird to the main source of meat in the United States? 91 pounds for every man, woman, and child. And chicken is growing fastest in consumption around the world since they're easier to raise than other animal products. So there's a really interesting scientific paper that was published at the beginning of this year by some scientists in England. They dubbed the broiler chicken, the, the chicken that we all eat every day, the bird of the Anthropocene. What they meant by that is that in this era where the world is now marked by what man has done to it. There is no better mascot than the chicken because there is no other bird that, we, no other source of protein that we produce at such scale, that we take so little care of, and that we have changed so much. They predicted that when our civilization is dug up thousands and thousands and thousands of years from now, our marker will be not the remains of our technology or the remains of our architecture, but a layer of chicken bones. So how did we get to that situation? Well, we talked about how there was this desire to produce more protein in World War II. There was a desire after World War II to cut costs. Chicken was perfectly adapted to that. Chicken was you know, chickens don't live very long, so you can crossbreed them pretty quickly. They don't need a lot of land, so you can produce a lot of them in a small area. And they're, they're moderately tasty, and they were hybridized to be more tasty. But another thing that happens with chicken, and it's, there's a very specific historical moment when it happens, is that in 1977, the federal government issued the first ever dietary guidelines for Americans which is a thing that now has come out of the government every couple of years ever since. In those guidelines, they said for the first time ever, Americans should eat less saturated fat. Now, they didn't actually say, but people heard them saying, Americans should eat less red meat. And since people thought they were being told not to eat red meat, they turned instead to white meat to chicken. And if you draw a, a graph of the consumption of beef and chicken in the United States over the decades, 1977, that year of the first dietary guidelines, is the year when beef starts to go down because Americans are always a beef-eating people and chicken starts to rise. And we now eat twice as much chicken as we do beef every year. Back in the 1970s, that ratio was reversed. So because the government puts out these guidelines, you're saying that's why Americans are eating more chicken? So that kind of was the first impetus, but another really interesting thing happens, which I think everyone will recognize, which is that the chicken industry realizes that with this government recommendation, there is a huge market opportunity for them. So 1977, the first dietary guidelines. 1980, the first chicken McNugget. What McDonald's did with the chicken nugget was take chicken off the bone and make it a thing that was available to everyone in an uncomplicated way. And there's actually fairly good evidence that McDonald's is not solely responsible for this idea, that the prototype of the nugget was actually invented by a crazy scientist at Cornell University in 1963 who was also looking for ways to increase chicken sales by making it possible for housewives not always to have to deal with a, a bony thing that they had to slice apart and roast or fry or something. He came up with chicken sticks that were kind of like fish sticks. 
And then McDonald's took the idea and ran with it. And in 1980, they produced a thing that was chicken that we could eat walking down the street, driving our cars, you know, put them on the, the kids' uh, tray on their, their um, on the dinner table and know they weren't going to mess, make a mess and fling the bones all around. So they made chicken. We, we already knew that chicken was smart to eat. They made it easy to eat. And that really is the moment where chicken consumption in America completely rolls off the charts. How did chickens 100 years ago go from being muscular, not delicious, and with a very rich flavor to today's chickens that are tender and soft? So an interesting thing happens to chickens. You know, we talked about how chickens back in our grandparents' or great-grandparents' time were these scrawny little things running around and flapping around a barnyard, and now they're very docile blocks of protein that sit in a barn. A chicken that runs around a barnyard, chasing its chicks, flapping up into trees to avoid the, the farm dog, scratching in the dirt, eating bugs and so forth, that has a rich and varied diet. And so it's going to have a rich and varied flavor. But it's also probably going to be pretty tough. Even if you take a young chicken, not a hen that's been running around for a couple of years, any bird that's getting exercise that is using its muscles is going, its muscles are going to be more like a rubber band. Um, and its muscles are also going to be more dark colored, like the dark meat is really going to be dark because it's been perfused with blood from all that exercise. Chickens like that didn't have very much meat on a carcass. And because they were chewy, they mostly had to be cooked in the sort of like slow, wet heat that our grandparents and great-grandparents used, like stew and fricassee and smothered chicken and things like that. So antibiotics makes it possible to produce more chicken. But then the chicken industry has to convince people to eat more chicken. And the way they do that is to make the chicken easier to eat, to make it not dark and not chewy and not strongly flavored. In the late 1940s and early 1950s, there's a nationwide contest to, to breed a better chicken, a chicken that consumers will find more palatable. They call it the chicken of tomorrow contest. And I always feel like there ought to be some sort of like science fiction-y kind of uh, sound effect behind me, my voice when I say that. Um, they, the USDA challenges chicken breeders across the country to come up with a chicken that is going to be um, less like a barnyard chicken. It has to be, uh, has to put on weight easily. It has to be kind of soft and delicious. It has to be white feathered because supermarkets already know that when you pull the feathers out of a chicken and the feathers are dark, they leave a sort of like cast in the skin that consumers don't find very palatable. And so this nationwide contest rolling from state to state to state produces by 1951 the chicken that we know today. And in making chicken more docile, more white feathered, um, more with more flesh on the bone per bird, they took the chicken out of the setting in which it had the conditions that made it tasty. And if you go, as I did for research to my book, to countries where chickens are now are still raised in that old manner, or even pastured farms here in the United States, which are returning to old production practices. Their chickens, when you cook them, look like what the chickens of the 1900s must have looked like. They're skinny, they're, they have less flesh relative to their bones, their flesh is bouncier, and it's incredibly delicious. When we say something tastes like chicken, most of the time, what we're really saying is that it doesn't taste like very much. It just kind of tastes like bland protein. But a chicken that's a barnyard chicken, whether it's an, a, an old variety of chicken or one produced by these new farmers, that's really tastes like chicken.